number, what does that number represent? If you take a vector and dot it with itself, it's, it's length squared. squared. Remember the, the theorem. What's the big theorem? Yes. U dot V is the length of U times the length of V times cosine of the angle between them. That's the big theorem from last class. So if I do U dot U, it's the length of U times the length of U times cosine of the angle between them. What's the angle between the same vectors? Zero. What's cosine of zero? One. So you get the length of U times the length of U, which is the length of U squared. So if you do U dot U, you get magnitude of U squared. If you do U cross U, you get the zero vector. That's just, I'm just you know, pointing out the property. All right, next one. Here we go. Now we're starting to get somewhere. Now we're starting to get somewhere. Find a vector that is perpendicular to the plane that passes through these three points. So I've given you three points sitting in space, right? Three points sitting in space. And what I want is for you to find a vector that is perpendicular to that plane. So you've got this plane sitting in space, and I want you to find me any vector, any vector you want, as long as it's orthogonal or perpendicular to the plane. Okay? Any ideas on how to do that? How to go about that then? We basically draw a triangle okay. and Yeah, we're going to draw a triangle with the three points, that real fancy one I drew earlier. And then we're going to create vectors. Why are we going to create vectors? Because we can only cross vectors. You can't cross points. So we've got to create the vectors, and then we're going to cross them. Perfect. So we're going to draw our very, very high tech. I mean, it's like, this takes years. I've been doing this for a long time. This takes years of practice. If you can't make it look this good, don't be down on yourself, OK? I mean, look at that perspective. Are these the same points from earlier or no? I don't think they are. They aren't. That would be nice if I would have made them the same. But OK. So we've got three points against triangle sitting in space. And now I want, I want something that comes out, right? So here's our three points. Boom, boom, boom. And I want those that defines a plane, right? It only takes three points, three unique points to define a plane, right? So I've got my plane defined. I need a vector coming out of this that's perpendicular. So I've got to create two vectors on here, cross them, and that'll pop me a vector out, right? So create the vectors. Your choice. You could go, you could go from, from here to here, here to here. You could go from here to here, here to here. You just need a pair, right? You want to go from here, down to here, and then here to here? Let's do that. Okay, this one, what do you want to call this one? U, okay, and then this one, here to here, we'll call that V. Those are two vectors that live, like, parallel to the plane. You could say those vectors live in the plane, kind of. And let's, let's see what they are. So U is uh, the vector... Let's see, let's see. Anyone having trouble with the, getting this vector from the points? Anyone having trouble with that? You okay with it? Yes? Are you all right with it? Sure? Good? Okay. Yes? Okay. All right. Then what is it? Negative three? One. One. Negative seven. Okay. And then V? Zero. Negative five? Negative five again, right? Yeah. Okay. Those are my vectors. I'm going to cross them now, right? I'm going to cross them. Do y'all notice how I wrote them just like right, like one on top of the other? It's because I knew I was going to cross them, and I can save myself a little bit of time by just doing this right here and just doing my little thing right now where I cover up and do that. You see what I'm saying? So U crossed with V. 
All right, that's going to give me this new vector. Let's see, I'm giving myself plenty of room here. Cover up the eyes. Determinant here. Okay, negative 5. Negative 5. Am I going to be subtracting or adding at the end of all this in here? I'm going to be subtracting, right? So it's going to be negative 5 and then minus 35. Negative 40. Do I need to show it? Negative 40. Okay, negative 40. And then minus, because I'm doing the middle one now, right? So it's always opposite. Let me go ahead and figure out what that number is. Okay, I'm covering up the middle one. Negative 3 times negative 5. 15? And then take away, well, it's not going to matter. That's 0, right? Yeah. So just 15? But there was a negative that's from the, that's from the uh, formula, right? not, not the determinant. And then the last one, we'll cover this up. 15, take away nothing again, right? Okay, yeah. 15. So I have the vector negative 40, negative 15, 15. Right? That's u cross v. Questions? I'm going to write the final answer up here. Find a vector perpendicular to the plane. Mm, let's do this. Okay, that's my answer. What did I do? That's a scalar multiple of it, isn't it? I scaled it. I divided everything by negative 5. Am I allowed to do that? What did the question ask me for? Find a vector perpendicular to the plane, right? Now, is this vector perpendicular to the plane? Yes, it is. But there's more than one, right? There's an infinite number of vectors that are perpendicular. Is this one? And any scalar multiple of this, right? I could shrink this, stretch it, right? I could point it in the other direction. It would kind of come out the other side of the plane. So I chose to just make it a nicer, smaller number vector. But that was just to make the point that I can in this problem. Yes? Is a zero vector a smart ass answer to this question? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it would be um, because, well, it, you could argue that the zero vector is perpendicular, right? For a problem like this, you could give that answer. But for where we're going with it, that won't help you do what we're going to be trying to do. So, All right. These are just properties of the cross product. Just like we had a bunch of properties of the dot product, these are a bunch of things that you can do and cannot do with the cross product. So can you commute them? Can you switch the order? Yeah, but you have to change the sign, right? That's what I was saying. It's going to point in the opposite direction. So this vector is going to be the negative of that vector. So they point just opposite. Um, this tells you how you, can, how you deal with scalars. This is uh, like an associativity property. If you're going to do a vector and you're going to cross it with the sum of two vectors, then you can cross the first two, cross the, sec cross the first one, ah, cross the u in the first one, cross the u in the second one, and then add those two vectors together. And there's just, there's a list of these. These, these properties really aren't that, not that important for what we're doing. And then we have a theorem. And man, this theorem looks extremely familiar, doesn't it? We had one for the dot product, right? U dot V was magnitude of U, magnitude of V, cosine of the angle between the two vectors. That was the big theorem from last class. Look at this new theorem for the cross product. It says the magnitude of the cross product, not the cross product, the magnitude, right? The cross product gives you a vector. The length of that vector, right? So when we, when we did those two vectors, right, and we crossed them, right, we crossed these two vectors, we got a vector that comes out orthogonal to both. This vector's length is equal to the length of one of them times the length of the other one times sine of the angle between them, not cosine. Is the angle between each of right? When you bring them tail to tail, it's that angle between them. Okay. Yeah, so if the other one is snagging, you know one, right? 
Yeah, the new one is 90 to the others. Exactly, yes. All right. So example five is actually really simple. I'm not going to do it. This is saying, hey, you know, the magnitude of V is 7, the magnitude of U is 3, and the angle between them is 31. Find the magnitude of the cross product. So you just plug it in here, right? 3 times 7, sine of 33 on your cal calculator. You're going to get some answer. And that's the length of that vector that's coming out orthogonal. Now, this may not seem like, like that big of a thing, like this little thing, this little result. But the magnitude of the cross product has this like mind-blowing like application, all right? And that's what we're about to get into. And we're, we're, gonna, we're doing good here today. We will get to it. It's right there um, after this one right here. So let's, re let's talk about this one first. Result of the uh, theorem for cross product. Two non-zero, two non-zero vectors, u and v, are parallel if and only if their cross product is zero, the zero vector. So we said if the dot product, if the dot product is zero, what can you tell me about the vectors? If the dot product is zero? They're orthogonal. They're, orthogonal, they're perpendicular to one another, right? This is saying if the cross product is the zero vector, then the vectors are parallel, right? So we have a check for parallel now. We already, coming into today, today, we had a check for orthogonality, right? For check for perpendicular. Now we have a check for parallel. Now this isn't used as much as the other dot product is for perpendicular. But it's nice to have a nice check, right? Again, think about how complicated that problem is. Like if I gave you, if, let's imagine I gave you like this point and this point, right? Those two points, let's connect it with the line. See that little line segment? And then I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna give you this point and this point, right? Little, see the little line segment? Are those line segments parallel? That's a hard question, isn't it? Like just generally, that's a hard question. Simple now, because what would you do? These two points, what would you do? Create a vector. Those two points, create a vector. Take those two vectors, cross them. If you get the zero vector, they're parallel. You see how simple that would be with, the, with this idea? As opposed to trying to like geometrically figure out like slopes or something? Super, super powerful. Here's the mind blowing thing though. Like, to me it's mind blowing. Area of a parallelogram formed by two vectors. So if you take two vectors, okay, if you take two vectors, what the hell? Give me a second, it's getting better here. There. There we go. Okay, let me. Uh, Okay, I want you to look at the red, the red and the black vector. Okay, you see the red and black vector? If you were to extend this, take these two vectors and form a parallelogram with them, right? Form a parallelogram with them, then that parallelogram has an area, right? And guess what? That area is equal to the length of the cross product vector. The vector that comes pop, pop, sorry, popping out, right? The vector that comes popping out when you cross the two vectors, the length of that is equivalent to the area of that, which is, whoa, that's weird, right? So if I were to you know, ask, hey, what's the area of that right there? You'd cross the two vectors, find the magnitude, you're done. That's it. So with that idea, I think we can, we can push ourselves here.
I'm going to draw a triangle for you again. Well, it's, the same. it's the same one, right? So I'm going to draw it again. I, mean, I know every time I put it up here, y'all are impressed, so I'm going to do it again. There it is. Look at that. Well, you know, ask me to draw a triangle in four-dimensional space, I and mean, that's when it gets interesting. Uh, I don't know if I'm labeling these. I don't know if I'm labeling these right or not, but in terms of what I did last time. But that's those are the same three points, right? So we're talking about the same. We're talking about the same triangle from earlier, right? Earlier, what were we asked to do here? Find a find a vector that was orthogonal or perpendicular to that plane, right? And we found one, didn't we? We crossed the two vectors. Now. We made up the vectors, right, didn't we? We did, we did this to here and this to here, right? Yes. Did I label this the same way? Yes. I think I did, right? And we called this one U, and we called this one V. And just as a reminder, it was U was uh, negative 40? Was it, uh, sorry, U, not U, U cross. U, when we crossed them, it was uh, negative 40. Negative 15, 15, right? That's what we got when we crossed the two? Okay. So, what we're being asked to do here is to find the area of this triangle, right? The area of this triangle. The theorem we just looked at said that if you take these two vectors in three-dimensional space and you look at the parallelogram formed by them, that the area of that parallelogram, right, let's call that A, what would that A be? The magnitude of the cross product of those two vectors. It'd be the magnitude of that. That would be the area of the parallelogram. What do we want? The triangle, which would be half of that, right? So we want basically half of the magnitude of the cross product of the vectors. So what we want here, let's find the magnitude of this. What's the magnitude of U cross V? Square root, uh, get your calculator out, because I'm going to need help on this one. 40 squared plus negative 15 squared plus 15 squared. And, uh, that be That's what it would be, yes. Uh, 450? Uh, two, oh, I'll put 225 just to. Yeah, but now what? That's the part that I was. So get an, get an approximate answer, like decimal. 45.3? OK, good enough. Approximately, right? Approximately. Uh, so this is a squiggly equal sign. And when I was a student, I thought squiggly equal was like just some, a joke that my professor was making up. Like, OK, that's funny. They're trying to be funny. It's like kind of equal. That's a mathematical symbol, OK? It means we are approximating. We are approximating. Because we're rounding, right? We're rounding. As soon as you start rounding, you're approximating, right? OK, so is that our answer? No. no, that's the magnitude. So that's the area of the parallelogram. We just take half of that now, right? So what's half of that? So the area of the triangle, to answer this, is going to be half of 45.3, which is approximately 20 what? 22.6. Approximately 22.6 units, right? I mean, come on, y'all got to give it up a little bit here, right? I mean, walking in today, had I made a you know, classroom assignment where I gave you three points in space and asked you to find the area of the triangle, right? Without vectors, you know, you're here till Christmas, right? I mean, maybe not, but you know what I mean? Like, think about the geometry that would be required to try and, you know, somehow, because that triangle does not have to be, like, flat, so you can't do, like, nice little, let's cut it up into right triangles, or you, you can't do, it, it's just so hard. Compared to this, right? I mean, how, was there anything like magical here? We were doing arithmetic. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Some square root stuff, but you know what I mean? Like I could, I could show my, I could show my, uh, my 13 year old daughter the arithmetic here and she wouldn't be blown away. And I'd be like, yeah, this is Cal 3. And she'd be like, really? Come on, seriously? Because the arithmetic's not that bad, right? It's just arithmetic. 
So now the idea is, remember that what we're doing here is our ultimate goal is to do calculus in three-dimensional space, right? We are building the foundation right now so that we're comfortable working in three space. Then we start doing the calculus in three space. So this is still just foundational stuff, right? All right, area got it. Okay, now another kind of cool thing, not as, uh, not as useful or not used as much, is this thing called the triple product, which is what if you have three vectors together, right? Imagine I have three vectors. I'm going to do it um, out here in three space here first. What if I have three vectors and I bring them all tail to tail to tail, three different vectors like this? Then these two vectors create a parallelogram, right? These two create a parallelogram, right? There's a parallelogram here, and I can create this this shape that would be like a skewed shoebox out of these three vectors. It would look something like this. Well, maybe. There we go. There we go. That's pretty good. Uh, no, keep it. I like that. That's three vectors. Do you all see I've created like this weird skewed shoebox looking thing? It's called a parallel piped. It's called a parallel piped, all right? And hey, maybe I spelled it wrong, but parallel piped. Maybe that e doesn't belong there. Hold on, that might be a misspelling. I'm not making up a word though. That's but that parallel piped, right? Should have a volume, shouldn't it? It should have a volume. And we have a formula for calculating the volume. It's called the triple, triple scalar product, or triple product, right here. So give me three vectors. And I, if you want me to find the volume of the parallel piped created by those uh, vectors, what I will do, I will cross any two of them. OK? That'll give me a what? Cross two vectors, you get a vector. So that'll give me a vector. I'll take that vector, and I will dot it with the third vector. That'll give me a number, and I'll take the magnitude of it, which will just make sure it's positive, and that will represent the volume of the parallel pipe. It's pretty freaking awesome, if you ask me. Again, we're not proving these theorems, are we? No. Yep, good. All right. It is, okay. What is the definition that you see there? What does it say? Or what is it? Parallel planes. Formed by six parallelogram sides to result in a three-dimensional figure or a prism which has a parallelogram base. Yeah, so it's basically six surfaces that are all yeah. parallel and pa parallel pairs. Yeah. All right, so this one I don't think I'm going to do because um, I think it's too, like we've already taken this far enough. Right here. Find the volume of the parallel pipe formed by those three vectors. Notice I gave you vectors, not points. So this is not the triangle I just drew. But we would, what, cross two of them? Cross two, whatever that answer is, dot it with this one. Take the magnitude, that's the, that's the volume. All right, last thing. Cross products and torque. This is physics. This is just as a reminder, like, just, hey, how does this tie into some stuff, you know, that maybe you've seen. So... In physics, uh, we have this thing called torque, right? If we tighten a bolt applying a force to a wrench, then we produce a turning effect, right? Everyone comfortable with the idea of a wrench and a bolt and turning and tightening, yes? Torque is a vector, right? Torque is a vector which represents the tendency of the bolt to turn. Torque is defined in physics to be this symbol right here. Torque is R. The vector r crossed with the vector f. Here, r is the position vector. That's basically the wrench. It represents the wrench. And then the, or the body of the wrench. f is the force acting on the wrench. And so when you take the, the wrench and you cross it with the force, you get this torque vector, which should be orthogonal to both of those. So here's the picture. 
So what I have here is, this is the wrench right here. Imagine that we're looking, we're looking at this two-dimensionally. There's a bolt here. I have a wrench. I'm going to turn this wrench by applying a force. You can almost imagine like I'm going to hang on it with a string and pull the end of the wrench down in this, in this direction. And the length, of the, the length of this red is how hard I'm pulling, right? When I do that, what's going to happen? When I pull down, this wrench is going to want to turn. What's the, what's the, what direction is the tightening going in? In, into the page, right? When you, that's if it's threaded right hand, right? Right hand threads. There's also called left hand threads. Was right, most threads are righty tighty, lefty loosey, right? Yeah. Y'all heard that? Those are called right hand threads, but there's also left hand threads. Anyone know where you see left hand threads? Like gas lines. And gas lines, really? Where? Like on like acetylene bottles. Oh, really? It's left hand? Yeah. I didn't know. Why would they have left hand on acetylene bottle? Do you know why? Hmm. That's you'll interesting. See in the nuts. Like, What's that? Like you'll see a notch on a nut. Uh huh. Like really? I'm curious to know why. Um, bicycle pedals. One of them is right hand. The other one is left hand. Because as you turn, as if think about what's happening. You know the bearings and stuff. On one side, as you turn, you have a tendency to want to tighten the bolt. But if it was threaded um, on the other side, if you or pedaling, then it's actually wanting to loosen the bolt, so they, they thread that the other way. So it's lefty, tidy, righty, loose. For what? Saws, saws. exactly, saws, yeah. yeah. So it depends on the rotation. But okay, so back to this. Assuming righty, tidy, lefty, loosey, if I go and I turn this way, it's going to want to go into the page, right? Okay, so what happens if I cross those vectors? Um, bring, let me bring those vectors into three dimensional space. Okay, which is over here, but bring these out, right, like this. The definition of torque is R crossed with, with the F, right? So here's R, here's F. If I put them tail to tail, and now I do R crossed F, R crossed F, right hand rule, R, F, right, curling into F, my thumb is into the page, right? So my cross product vector is this. This is us looking at it from, oh shit, oh I can't rotate this, damn it. Okay, I can't rotate it. Um, looking from the top down, we would see that picture. So the, why, what am I getting at? Why am I showing you all this? Just to kind of give you an illustration. What would happen, where do I get the most torque? How could I get the most torque? If, if my force is constant, imagine my force is constant, how would I get the most torque? If I am What's the relationship between these two vectors? <laughs> perpendicular, right? They need to be perpendicular. Now, one way you can see that is by thinking about that formula. When you take the magnitude of the cross product of two vectors, it's the magnitude of u, magnitude of uh, v, sine of the angle between them, right? Right? Sin what's that? And what's sine of 90? One. So when is the magnitude of the cross product going to be the biggest? When that's a one, and that's going to happen when theta is 90, which means you want your force acting on the wrench to be exactly perpendicular to the wrench. You will get the greatest torque that way. Right? If you do this, what happens if you ask someone to, to go tighten the bolt, and they go and they do this? Right? <laughs> Well, mathematically, the torque's going to be what? Zero. Zero, right? They're pulling on the end of the wrench. That's when you fire them, right? You say, goodbye. We have something else. You're going to go inside and make copies all day. <laughs> um, right? Or this, right? Again, the angle between two vectors right, is going to give you a zero here. And they're pushing at the end of the wrench. So I mean, this, this is just a visual. I mean, this is everything we've been doing can it be applied to torque. All right, um, time-wise, how are we doing? 34, oh, perfect. Okay, we're done with these sections. What's next? What's coming? Let's talk about what's coming. Did I pass around the sign sheet? Yeah. Yeah. Good job, I did good today. I didn't even bring it up. All right, so let me, let me just uh, give you a quick little preview. Equations of lines and planes. Things are going to start to get 
accelerated pretty quickly in here, right? And so when we get into this, especially the next take-home exam, right, is going to be a challenging one. It's going to be quite a bit of stuff you're going to have to kind of put together. So um, just be ready. Do your homework for the other sections. We come in and start talking about lines and planes. Uh, we're basically going to go back and do lines that we did in college algebra, but now in three-dimensional space. We're going to define lines using something other than y equals mx plus b, which is great for a sheet of paper. We're going to have a new definition for a line. It's going to be a vector equation for a line. It's going to be with us for the rest of the class. We're going to be using this. And then we're also going to start to define planes in a, diff in a different way, and it's going to involve that cross product vector that we were just working with. So, that's where we're headed, and then eventually we'll be out of chapter 10 and we'll get in chapter 11 where the calculus really begins. So have a good weekend, yeah? Do your homework. No change on the take home yet, all right? I, I think, uh, well. Yeah, the homework you should do is everything from 10.3 and 10.4. Yeah, try it. I mean, you may get hung up, but. So I have the, the test due on the, when is it? 13th? No. Was it 13th? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's do this. Let's officially, let's do it officially. I'm going to officially change this to the next time we meet after this. Okay. So that'll be on the 18th. Now, there's a little catch to that. This is now going to be due on the 18th. You're probably going to get your next take home exam, your next mini exam, you're probably going to get it before you even turn this into me. Which means I'm going to expect that, that yes, you'll probably wrap this up and start working on the next one. It's just the material that I need to cover, I'm going to cover on Monday. I don't want to have that due on Wednesday for you. You know what I mean? I'm giving you the weekend, but the, the stuff, the material is going to keep coming. So it's like a even though I'm postponing it, I'm not changing, I'm not pushing the other test further back. The others are going to stay where they are. Okay. All right, y'all have a good one. Reach out if you need me for help. The worst thing for me is for y'all to come in the day of the test needing help on three problems that are due in, th in two hours. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Let me turn.